thank you guys all for coming out. Um, this is pretty exciting for me. Um, so uh, let's just jump into this. Um, I'm hoping with this presentation, it's if you're kind of looking for like practical hands-on tips or, or anything like that, you might not get as much um, what I want to convey or, or describe or uh, provide to you is, is more the, the passion that um, I, I discovered and I found in this subject. And um, hopefully I can, at least with a few of you, ignite a passion for you guys as well. Um, so I come from a programming background. So when I look at deep learning, I, I see it through that lens. And what, I, what I've come to believe is, you know, anything that I can do with code, I can probably do with a neural network, except that the difference is I don't actually have to program it at all. Um, imagine if you could just create any sort of function, any sort of program, Python code, whatever, without actually having to do any programming at all, no matter how complex it is, how difficult it is. Um, this is what I really see in deep learning, and I think it's, um, ah, hold on, my, uh, see if my clickers, let me get my clicker working here. I might just have to use my hands. Uh, so, in the beginning, um, like, uh, oh, you have another clicker? Perfect, thank you. Uh, like a lot of people, as I've discovered, I thought I was somewhat unique, but um, I really got into artificial intelligence through video games. And my, f my very first exposure to this concept and, and field of, of AI um, was through um, you know, playing Age of Empires and trying to code my own uh, little AI to play that game through chess and through, through other games. Um, and I've been programming for a long time, from, from a, a pretty young age. I started programming when I was 10 years old. Uh, and as a teenager, I became very obsessed with a game known as, as Globulation 2. And th this is an open source video game. And the, the key aspect of this game was that um, you worked in tandem with, I don't know if I would call it an AI, but it, it you, you worked in tandem with uh, the machine, and the machine would do a lot of the like low-level work of, of running your, your base and, and your attacks. So instead of having to um, you know, command individual units like you might in Age of Empires or you know, um, Command and Conquer or any of these other video games, uh, instead you would give high-level orders like, I want you to attack this general area, or I need you to build these types of buildings on average. And the AI would actually fill in the gaps. It would execute the low-level orders so that you could kind of stay on a high level. And I, I really loved this game, and, and it was really uh, my first sort of um, uh, inroad into artificial intelligence as, as a hands-on subject. Um, but as I became a little older, I took a business degree instead of going into computer engineering, which a lot of people might think is crazy. Um, I tried to start my own business, didn't work out too well, um, and I was broke, and I was back to programming just to try and make ends meet, doing websites or um, actually around the time mobile apps were starting to become like a real deal, so I did a lot of that. Um, and just jump, jumping forward a little bit, I ended up joining this company called Sensibil, and our basic uh, challenge was to process receipts. Uh, effectively, we had to do this. We had to take an image of a receipt, which you photographed with, say, your mobile phone, or you scanned in using a scanner, and convert it into fully structured database data. Um, this is JSON, but um, you could imagine in any sort of arbitrary um, structure. Basically, we had to take that image, convert it into JSON. And when I joined Sensible, I really didn't know anything about machine learning. Uh, I had a very vague sense of AI. I had read a book and uh, heard about these things called neural networks, but um, they weren't even popular at that time. That was like 2014, and it was, it was very fresh. Um, so what we did is we created a what you might call a hand-baked heuristic algorithm. We just tried to solve the problem using any way we could. Um, 
as it turns out, the, the heuristic algorithm that we quote unquote invented uh, turns out to be k nearest neighbor, um, which is not a surprise. It's like the oldest machine learning algorithm in the book. Um, but we were able to kind of independently invent it in a way. Um, but it was, um, it, it got us started. It, for me, I, I came into machine learning literally through trying to solve this specific problem and actually had no prior education or experience in it. Um, but nevertheless, um, I got a lot of valuable experience out of that. You know, building data sets, uh, designing how to label data and annotate your data, building the user interface around that. Um, building a team that where people label data. We actually had a team of six people continuously labeling uh, the data within the receipt images in order to be able to do the extraction. Testing different algorithms. Um, we d I tried decision trees. Uh, I actually did try a neural network, but it didn't really work that well at that time. And um, it, it was very interesting in those days, and I, I, I really kind of stumbled into the field of machine learning more than I, more than I chose it. Um, but one day I, I read this blog article, and this blog article, I don't know, how many people have actually read this? Has anyone here actually seen this article before? Okay, it, in a way, what I'm trying to do with this presentation might be the same as what that person did in that article. Um, in this article, uh, Basically, one of the you know originators of a lot of this uh, deep learning research just describes his experience with deep learning and, and applying it on things such as generating uh, Shakespeare plays, generating code. He has it generate like Wikipedia articles out of random. And when I went through the article, I, my mind was was absolutely blown. Honestly, it was it was um, I saw the author's passion. And I also just saw, I was like, wow, like this, this is really amazing. Like how can it possibly generate such realistic looking Shakespeare? Or uh, it, when it spat out code, it, the, the code that it generated, um, well, if you actually read it, it clearly wouldn't execute. But you know, at first glance, it looked like real code. And it was, it was honestly pretty amazing to me to, to see that you could do this and that neural networks were so powerful. It was, it was like I had been missing out on something that I had learned so much about engineering and about software, about um, everything from user interfaces, back end, front end, um, you know, uh, APIs, but I, I had never seen this before. And so at Sensible, we upgrade. We upgrade to deep learning. Uh, we start using LSTMs instead of our hand-baked K nearest neighbor algorithm. And it completely changed the game for us. It basically made the company because prior to that, we were getting, you know, accuracy levels end to end of like 60, 70 percent. We train our first neural network on the exact same data, and our accuracy jumps. It's now like 97, 98. The vast majority of receipts are going through without a hitch. In fact, most of the problems usually resolved from people taking shitty photos more than it was about uh, our algorithm being bad. Uh, as far as I could tell, um, the, the deep neural network had basically solved the problem. It was, we were getting close to perfect results, and the only times where the result was not perfect was um, when the photo was bad, or the receipt was smudged, or uh, people had like, you know, written all over the receipt, or they wrote a smiley face, or you know, other issues like that. Uh, so long as the image was good, um, the algorithm worked nearly perfectly. It was, it was such a massive improvement. And when I actually saw that for the first time, you know, having spent two and a half years at that point working on our hand-baked K nearest neighbor algorithm and, and slowly fine tuning it and adding more features and, and different ways of, of weighting things, um, when we upgraded to the deep learning, I was like, holy shit, like this is, this is, this is game changing. Like this, this technology is going to completely reinvent how everyone everywhere uses computing. Um, and I became obsessed, honestly, I, I, be, I started to, um, uh, uh, dive in. I wanted to learn everything I possibly could about neural networks, uh, which in 2015, there was, it, it was, there was stuff coming out, but it, it wasn't hot yet. It was still very early in the days of, of deep learning. 
Um, so I managed to, and living in Toronto as well, where uh, deep learning it was, um, a lot of the researchers who invented deep learning uh, came out of Toronto. Um, I really had a very uh, big advantage in being able to talk to people and communicate with uh, experts in the field at a point when it was very early. And 2015 is not even that long ago, but um, yeah, it was very early. So I dive in deep, I start learning everything I possibly can. And so I have a secret. My secret is I really don't like math that much. Or it, it's not that I don't like math. I don't like math equations. I, I really just, I find them to be difficult to work with, largely because, um, oh, does this have a, nice. So largely because math equations can never stand by themselves the way that code can. People use, say, single characters, like an O with a, you know, squared on it, that representing standard deviation. Uh, I would much prefer if this equation up here was written more like this. You know, that's more the programming way, where you don't just use a single letter, because a single letter is meaningless. Um, what you actually use is like full written out versions of equations. So I've just, I have this, this, it's not that I don't understand math, I just really don't like the symbology and the representation that we use in math equations. And, and so I, I struggled with it um, in reading papers for a long time. But o over the last four years, what I, I've, I've realized is that you don't actually need to know the equations at all. You don't even need to look at them. Um, but you, you do need to know a decent amount about what's actually going on inside the neural network. You just don't need to know it at the, at the level of the equation. Um, what you really should be studying are the graphs and the charts and the anecdotes. Um, and people's sort of high-level intuitions about deep learning is much more valuable. So here's an example. How do you choose an activation function? Um, and I recognize that there's a lot of newer uh, activation functions than sigmoid and tan h. There's ReLU and SELU and ALU and leaky ReLUs, and now there's the swish function, and people are trying all sorts of different things. But I, I just want to highlight how would you analyze the difference between the sigmoid and the tan h function, which to me are just kind of random equations. So I plot them in a chart. The sigmoid um, goes between 0 and 1. It can literally take any number, whether it's very large negative, very large positive, very small. Um, and converts it into a number that goes between 0 and 1 and in a very consistent way. Uh, and most of the action, most of the interesting stuff happens right around the center. Uh, how does that compare to a tan h? Well, the tan h uh, you know, has the same sort of S-curve shape. You know, technically, it's a little steeper, but if you put them side by side. But uh, for the most part, what I realize, the only real relevant difference between the, the sigmoid and the tan h is that the sigmoid goes between 0 and 1, and the tan h goes between negative 1 and positive 1. That's the only major difference. So when does it matter? How, so if I'm building a neural network, what, when am I going to choose which one to use? Um, the only question was, like, do I need negative numbers or not in my, my equations? And if, if you don't care, then it doesn't matter at all. Just use whatever happens to give you the highest accuracy. And th this simple intuition allowed me to um, really move forward and just and kind of get over the fact that, um, you know, I may not fully understand the mathematics behind uh, the tan hyperbolic tangent, um, but I don't need to. Uh, all I really need to do is just have a few high-level key pieces of knowledge about what, what the intuitions of these equations are in order to use them. So here's another example. What do layers do? Uh, neural networks, they're composed of layers. Um, it's actually, I mean, the latest neural networks, they're not even layers. They can get very complicated. Um, but um, anyhow, the, the layers are sort of the basic building block. And uh, one way of interpreting, uh, say, an LSTM, uh, one way of interpreting what an LSTM is, is, is this. It's a whole bunch of equations and, and uh, steps of processing. And um, you, know, you can kind of solve and expand or rearrange however you want. Um, this is definitely one way of, of understanding the LSTM, but it's actually not very useful. What I found was that this representation of the LSTM, this, I, I can't remember, I don't know who actually did this, this beautiful chart, but um, I did not understand what an LSTM was until I saw this chart. Those equations did nothing for me. 
But this chart says everything. It tells you about how information is flowing. It tells you, um, you know, what are the math operations that are involved here. And, and it allows you to get a good intuition about what are the different units of an LSTM. Um, and it also allows you to compare it to the variance, like the GRU, which is, um, uh, you know, has a lot of similarities to the LSTM, but, you know, just like a little bit more reduced. It's a little more light on the computation. Um, same thing with convolutions. You know, convolution, the one way to understand a convolution is definitely the equation that describes the kernel and how the kernel applies to the data that it's run on. But if, if you've ever looked at convolutions, I'm sure some of you have seen an image like this where it's um, showing how an original image is, is going through these various layers and, and how these feature detectors um, are able to kind of remove and abstract the information out of the network. Um, I never, I didn't understand crap when I saw this. You know, if a professor came and told me what a convolutional network is and gave me an equation like this, I'd be like scratching my head wondering what the heck is going on. But when I saw this, uh, I immediately understood what uh, the, the convolution actually does and, and wh what's its meaning and, and what does it accomplish within the context of deep learning. Um, so, you know, understanding the layers. L layers can be understood as math equations. Um, they can even be understood as code is another way of interpreting it. But, but why bother going to that level? Um, what I realized is, is this is much like understanding a CPU or the GPU now. You don't need to understand how the data or the electricity flows within a CPU in order to write code. In fact, I still don't. Um, you know, I tried to do VHDL one day and I was just in Verilog and it just, that's a totally different world. Like creating chips and hardware, that's such a more difficult problem. Um, but I didn't need, I, you don't need to know how, how Intel does their magic in order to write code that can run on an Intel chip. And deep learning, I think, is the same way. Like, yes, you can understand it at the, the lowest possible level, which is, uh, you know, what are the asymptotes in these equations and, you know, what are their free points and, and whatnot. But it's actually much easier to just, just try to analyze it at a higher level and see these as, as building blocks that you can put into your system. Um, so I, I developed over time a bit of a high-level intuition, and, and some people's intuitions about what these layers do, they may be very different. Um, you know, a dense layer, it, it's basically like a processing unit. It will change, rearrange, or compute data in some way. What does a convolution do? It, it's a pattern matching. It has some fixed number of patterns that it can learn to recognize, and it will recognize them across whatever data you input. Uh, recurrent, it's, uh, um, Actually, I say here is it processes data of an arbitrary size. That's true of the convolution and attention systems as well. But um, I find it, it's just best to understand it's more like a sequence processing unit, where as a dense layer processes one item, the LSTM processes a sequence of items. And that's all I really needed to know to be able to use and apply the LSTM in, in the real world. Uh, attention layers, they, they suppress irrelevant information. Um, and Dropouts, they spread knowledge across a vector. Batch norm, all you really need to know is it speeds up learning. Like, yeah, you can get deep and understand moments and gradients. And over time, I've, I've, I've come to understand um, at a much lower level what, what these units are doing and, and how the equations work. But I didn't actually need that in order to start diving in and understanding deep learning. Um, oh, what? Ah, there we go. There's also, I, I've come to see a bit of analogies between these layers and conventional programming. For example, a projection, which is, is just a dense layer without an activation unit, I kind of saw it more like casting. You know, it's like uh, you have a, a big pipe and you need it to fit into a small pipe, you're going to use a projection layer in order to do that. Uh, that's really all I needed to know. I saw a dense layer as like a version of a function that you can just learn and teach over time. A recurrent layer, it's like a for loop, you know? Anything that I can do in a for loop uh, within code, uh, I can also do it with a recurrent LSTM. 
convolutional layer. Uh, convolutional layers, actually, it's, it's harder to make an analogy for the convolutional layer, but my, the analogy that I kind of landed on after a long time was, was it's like a regular expression. Uh, does everyone here know what regular expressions are, hopefully? Um, yeah. So a regular expression is basically just like a pattern that matches on text. And I found that the convolutional layer is the best analogy for it was that. It's like a fixed pattern. It will match where it matches, and it doesn't where it doesn't. An attention layer, um, they're actually even more difficult. Um, I found that the best analogy for it was like a learned version of a MapReduce, uh, particularly self-attention layers, which are, are more like that. Um, so over time, I, I was able to gain these intuitions and, and these understandings of, OK, wh what are different? What are these layers doing? How do they interact? And, and w w you know, how can I think about them in a way that allows me to solve new problems? Now you get past the layer, you get to the architecture, which is like a whole lot of layers assembled in sequence, is actually pretty much impossible to understand it at the math level. You have to, you have to analyze it as a graph. You have to form intuitions about what's actually happening. Uh, you can't really do it with, with such a low level um, interpretation. Uh, so uh, you know, here's a few examples of just like different designs of, of neural network and architectures. You have your inputs, you have a bunch of processing layers, you might have uh, different things that come in at different points in time. Uh, the top one there is sort of like a ResNet, the middle one. Th these aren't actually real design, they're just demonstration purpose only. Um, so what are the edges and the nodes in the graph? So technically an edge is a vector. Um, could be a multi, like any number of dimensions, you'll have the batch, the batch dimension on the top and then yeah some number of dimensions uh, lower, and that's, that's great. But if, if I talk to um, a lot of programmers, um, and I, I use the word vector, um, that's something that they haven't you know, touched since university. You know, if I'm talking to someone who's like a 45-year-old CTO, he may be very smart, but as soon as I use the word vector, it's right over his head. But in intuitively, there's a much easier and simpler uh, way of interpreting what the edge in these graphs is. And the edge being, um, again, the, the lines that connect different nodes, um, it's information. Uh, and basically, any information can be represented within that edge. Um, what is a node? Yeah, technically, it's a bunch of math equations that operate on the vector. But intuitively, I, I, I found that the node is just better to be understood as, as a unit which processes information. It has some limited capacity in terms of how much it can process information, which is why you need multiple layers. But that's all I really needed to know about it. Um, and so w once you have these intuitions, there, there's, you, you get a, start to get a sense of, of, of what's happening. Now, this is um, um, an example of a, a, we can call it an architecture, but it's like a graph trying to explain translation. Um, now, in the last couple years, the translation has come to be uh, totally dominated by attention um, systems, um, but when I first created this presentation, the cutting edge was to have this sort of encoder-decoder approach where you encode the, the input sequence in some language and um, you decode it in some other language. And so what does having this intuition about edges and nodes allows me to do? Well, imagine this point right here. What is the information that flows between the, the input section and the output section. Intuitively, if, if this neural network is to be able to work at all, this little edge right here, this little blue line, must contain, it necessarily must contain all ne information about the input sentence. Um, it, ha it has to describe the sentence because that, that's the only way that information can get from the, the encoders to the decoders. Uh, so in intuitively, once we realize, okay, the, all of the information about that sentence in some sort of representation has to travel through that edge, um, well, you can do kind of interesting things. And, and what people do is they uh, take the, the data and they uh, run it through and they, they take that, that vector out from the middle of the neural network and you can plot it, and, and, and what you find is that sentences that have similar meanings tend to have very similar vectors. This is probably not a surprise for any of you, especially if, if you've ever heard of word vectors, but you can have sentence vectors now. There's research on document vectors, or vector for anything. 
So what was the intuition I was able to get? Any information can be represented in a vector. It doesn't matter what it is or how abstract it is or how difficult or complicated it is. You know, we, we have all of these data structures uh, in, in databases, you know, lists and arrays and objects and many, many different columns. Um, but literally, no matter how complicated the information is, um, the intuition that I was able to get was um, it can always be represented in a vector. There's always some way that information in the abstract can be represented. Um, the inception network, another one. Uh, so in the inception network, the kind of interesting thing, of course, is it has a lot of repeating units, and the repeating units kind of have this, this shape. Um, so uh, again, yeah, you, you could understand, really dive deep, and you know, there's some math proof that says like when you sequence these convolutions in this specific way, you get slight it's like mathematically equivalent to a, a simpler formula, but um, uh, but um, slightly faster in compute power. But basically, the intuition that I got when I when I first learned about the inception network is that sometimes it's useful to process the same vector in multiple ways. Um, you might want to pass it through different types of layers and then merge them again together. And that was the only thing I needed to learn from the inception network. Residual networks, um, love residual networks. They're, they're great, they're a big improvement. Um, what was the intuition I was able to get from ResNet? Uh, basically, um, neural networks sort of work like gossip. Um, if you've ever um, experienced gossip, it's you know, someone, you, someone says something about you, and then you know, they tell it to their friend, they tell it to their friend, they tell it to their friend, and by the time you find out, it's like, oh, you cheated on your girlfriend. You'd be like, what? Like, yo, I had a you know, glance a person in a bar once. Like, that's, but that's gossip. You know, it, the information to gradually gets destroyed the more layers it goes through. And that's, so if you add paths around, um, the information doesn't get destroyed. And it gets preserved, and the gossip doesn't, doesn't end up um, killing it. Um, Another way of understanding it was like the game telephone. I don't know if, uh, you know, when people, it's like you get a bunch of like eight-year-old kids in a room and like one person whispers into the ear of the other person who whispers into the ear of the other kid who whispers into the ear of the other kid. And you find that, you know, you might have started with something great like we love reading. And by the end, as it gets around the circle of eight-year-old children, the final kid speaks out loud and it's like, I hate the teacher, you know, some other, you know, nonsense that had no nothing to do with, with it. So, you know, the intuition that we were able to get from ResNets, yeah, you could understand it as an equation and, you know, you have the, the addition at the end and normalization, but really it was just that, like, the information degrades as it goes through a neural network. If the neural network's just too large, the information's so degraded, but by the end, the network can't learn. Um, so, you know, as you start to experiment and play and, and do a lot of models, y you start to get very comfortable with what works, what doesn't. You might be able to start creating your own designs. Um, the, but the big challenge is there's, there's, just, there's so many ways you can build a neural network. Like, so, so many ways. It is uh, actually amazing um, just, just how much um, uh, experimentation is actually required to get to something that works. A lot of um, my work is trial and error. It's just test it out, run it on my data, measure the accuracy, and try again. Come up with new ideas. You know, uh, ideally, if you can get into sort of a, I'm going to trigger my model at 5 p.m., come in at 8 a.m. in the morning, look at the results, try and set up something new. If you can get into that overnight loop, it, it works really well. Um, but it, it's not like programming. Um, programming. And, and having that software engineer background, um, I, I came from this, this, this mentality that code either works or it doesn't. And it's like, you, you write a bunch of unit tests, the unit tests pass or the unit tests fail. Like, it's, it's very binary. Deep, deep learning, and actually machine learning in general, it's, actually, it's not specific to deep learning, it always works, at least a little bit. The, the neural network can, um, my friend said it best, and, and Julian's actually the guy who got me into deep learning, um, the neural network always learns something. It, it'll, it, whether, it, whether it learns something useful, you don't necessarily know. You have to really do a lot of investigation and measurement. But it always learns something. And that can be both profound and annoying when you're working with neural networks. Because the only thing that matters is, is was, did it learn better or worse? 
Um, in regular programming, yeah, there's maybe, you know, code can be more efficient. Uh, you can have the same algorithm that gets to the same result in a better way. But for the most part, when, when we're analyzing code, again, it, it either works or it doesn't. Whereas with deep learning, it, it always works at least a little bit. It's just, is there another way you could do it that, that works better? Uh, so here's an example that came up in my work at Electric Brain. We had this client that wanted to automatically um, analyze project plans and decide what laws and regulations might apply to that project plan. Uh, this is a company called Blueprint. Uh, they create a tool like Jira or like, you know, it's like, um, uh, like a sprint management program. Um, so if you can imagine, like our input is text, basically, of a project plan. And our output is some number of laws or regulations that actually apply to that text. Um, there's so many ways you can do this. So like the most vanilla way is just send that text through a bunch of uh, recurrent layers and, and at the end just output that sort of binary indicator for each of the you know, 200 or 300 laws that, that we, it was actually 600 laws that we cared about at the time. And that's okay, you know, there's a number of hyperparameters and um, it's pretty simple. But you also have, you know, fancier approaches where you're not doing it one sentence at a time. Uh, I've become really fascinated with these uh, memory networks, which uh, they have like an external storage and uh, there's like an intention mechanism that allows them to store and retrieve data. Um, they really fascinate me and I, I just love, but they require a lot of GPU power to train. Uh, so anyhow, that's, a, that's another approach. The, another approach is um, don't do it sentence by sentence, but just do the entire project plan and use these memory networks as a way to um, preserve the long-term memory. Uh, you have way more hyperparameters, um, you know, a lot more challenge there. Uh, but again, it, it's, it's valid. It's potentially a good design. Uh, then there's a third way. The third way was actually to, to treat both the project plan as text and the regulation as text and feed both of them through LSTMs and, and have some sort of Siamese construction where um, they would actually um, you, you could reduce both the, the regulation and the, the project plan to vectors, and then, you know, Euclidean distance on those vectors would, would tell you just how relevant that project plan is, is to that, um, that regulation. Um, again, yeah, lots of hyperparameters, and, um, you know, this, uh, there's not a clear way to tell which, which is the best approach, at least not on face value. Um, there's far too many techniques basically to test. So the, the fun, um, the joy for me of designing uh, deep neural networks and, and what has made me more and more passionate about it over time is, is that it, it, it's like a dark art. And frankly, I, I, I really, Google's got a huge office in Toronto and, and I really wish I worked there because sometimes when you read a paper that Google has released and they're like, we trained uh, using 2,000 GPUs oh, for three months on this model. And I'm like, that's a great model, but that was a $100,000 experiment. Like, they, that, that one experiment costed $100,000 of compute power. It's like, only Google could do that. And of course, it would be just amazing to, and fabulous to be a researcher at Google, but um, you, you don't really get that. Um, and you have to, over time, get an intuition on, on what's likely to work. Uh, you can't just copy a result from, you know, the latest NIPS paper uh, and just apply it on your problem. Um, you have to get a sense of, you know, what neural network is likely to work with my data, um, you know, how big is my data set, and th those things, um, they take time, you know, that, that doesn't require, you don't get that when you, when you study at a university, working on academic problems or, you know, MNIST data set, um, you know, you, you don't really learn uh, how to choose or design neural networks. All, all you really get is what's possible. Uh, but the art of, of what's good, you have, to, you have to dig in yourself. And the joy for me is it has been that process of, of learning what works in deep learning and what doesn't work. Um, we don't have a clue how neural networks work. Like, there, okay, there'll be some people in the field who do say that they, they understand and that they get it. Oh, it's backpropagation, man. Like, that's the neural network, of course, backpropagation. Like, and, you know, it's half random chaos that emerges to order. And, yeah, okay, I, I, I like that. But actually, it's, it's not really 
it's not a complete understanding. Um, I think what it, it's, it's not hard to understand why neural networks are capable of learning. What, what's difficult to understand is why do they actually work so well? Um, you know, why can I take you know, a one-layered neural network and a five-layered neural network and they get almost exactly the same accuracy? Like, well, why? Like, th those are very different. You know, how can I take a, a one convolutional network and a recurrent network, I can both apply both of them on the same data, and they both do happen to work. You know, one's maybe one or two percent better. Um, why? 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 Did, why is? Why is? You, are you capable of using these things, which are totally different mathematically? They have completely different representations: a recurrent network versus a convolutional network. But yet, they can they can both work to almost exactly the same accuracy, or, or very close, when applied on the same problem. Um, yeah, there's there's a science in deep learning, but but there's also an art. And, and that art has, is, is what I love. I, I love getting that intuition. I love diving deep, you know, testing different hyperparameters and different architectures and just observing hands-on what actually works. And so if I recommend to you, if you're interested in, 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 and like deep learning and, and, and want to explore the field, um, just dive in. Like, don't, don't I, I meet so many people whose first uh, thought when when they want to dive into deep learning is like I'm gonna do a course or I'll do the Stanford AI course or the Andrew NG course or I'll do Coursera uh, or I'm, I'm gonna study the math As you get a lot of these uh, physics people especially where they they left physics because there's no jobs and they come into data science and, and they have to understand the math like it's it's an absolute necessity and I'm like, I, I just don't think that that's actually going to help you become good at deep learning. Um, the math will help you understand what the neural network does, but it, it, it gives you the science, but it doesn't give you the art. Uh, so my, my conclusion, uh, anyone with a technical background can do deep learning. If you've done software engineering, go onto the TensorFlow website and start pounding out some tutorials. It, it's not hard. Uh, you don't need to dive deep into the math. You don't really need to understand like Hessian, whatever, whatever gradients or, um, uh, but what you do need to understand and what you do need to learn is, is much harder. It, it's, it's the intuition about what's likely to work, what's not likely to work, what should I test first and what should I test next? Uh, how do I maximize the accuracy? How do I regularize? Uh, those are not always easy questions to answer and, and that intuition for me is, is a lot more fun and, and, and interesting um, than the kind of deep, low-level details of deep learning. Um, so thank you, and um, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.